So hi everyone, um, we've got a few classes here already and a few people already attending. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, welcome back to Shark Talk with Sharks for Kids. Um, we had a great session last week where Julius taught us how to draw a saw shark. So if you missed that, go ahead and check it out on our YouTube channel. Um, but for today, I'm really excited to be welcoming the fantastic Isla Hodgson, Dr. Isla Hodgson. Um, she's a conservation scientist, a wildlife guide, a scuba diver, and an all-around ocean enthusiast, just like all of us, I'm sure, certainly just like me. Um, and she's working out of the wild west coast of Scotland, which is one of my favorite places in the world. So I'm super excited to be hearing all about this, things she gets up to out there. Um, she actually takes people on encounters with the second largest fish species and shark species in the world, the Baskin shark. Um, and they're one of my favorite and I'm really jealous of her work because it's on my bucket list and I still haven't got to do it. Um, so I'm gonna be very envious watching her talk. Um, and she's also an education ambassador for the Save Our Seas Foundation, uh, where she hosts their web series, The Whole Tooth. So if you haven't heard of The Whole Tooth, I really recommend that you go and check it out. They answer all of your questions about sharks and the oceans. Um, and you might even see some familiar faces on there if you go and check it out. And you could ask your own question and feature it, feature on it yourself. So I'm gonna let Isla introduce herself further. Uh, if you have any questions for her, drop them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and I will ask them to her at the end of the talk. So Isla, thank you so much for being here and the floor is all yours. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me. And that was an amazing introduction, Jenny. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, I'll just share my screen quickly. Okay. So you should all be able to see that. Can you see that? Yes, fantastic. Right, we'll get started. Um, so Jenny already gave me a wonderful introduction, but I just wanted to say hello to everybody. Um, and also if I can, there we go, slightly behind. Um, wanted to kind of like introduce myself just a little bit further. So as Jenny said, uh, my name's Isla. I am a, I'm just, there we go. Now it's working. Um, I'm a scientist. Uh, I'm also a scuba diver. Uh, I'm a presenter and I'm also a wildlife guide as well. So um, I wear many, many different hats uh, and I live in Scotland, which is right at the top of the United Kingdom there. And I actually live in a place called Oban, which is just on the West Coast here. Uh, and as Jenny said, it's a pretty amazing place to live. We have so much wildlife up here. It's great. It's a little bit cold, but it is amazing. And there's so much to explore. Um, and I spend most of my time under, uh, under the water. Uh, so I'm a scuba diver, like I said, this is me uh, surveying some kelp forests here. Uh, and I'm also, I also dabble in free diving as well. Uh, so I just do pretty much anything that I possibly can uh, to be underwater as much as possible outside of the pandemic, obviously. Um, and I'm also absolutely mad about sharks, as we all are, I, I imagine. So uh, this is me uh, presenting our, my series for the whole, for the Save Our Seas Foundation, which is called The Whole Tooth. Uh, sometimes I wear the shark onesie, uh, sometimes I don't. Uh, but this show is basically all about sharks and it's absolutely brilliant because I get to answer lots and lots of people's questions about sharks um, and we actually pitch your questions to marine biologists from all over the world of which Jenny was one of them. Um, and I also am super lucky to work for a company called Basking Shark Scotland and um, so we're based out of Oban which is where I live um, and this is exactly what we do. So we take people in the water with sharks. You can see the fin of the basking shark there. And this is us uh, looking at it underneath the water. Uh, and the reason that we do this um, is not only to give people an amazing experience with these, with these awesome sharks, which we're gonna learn a little bit more about later on, 
um, but it's also so that we can learn more about them because they are very mysterious and we don't actually know that much about them at all. And these guys, now I've introduced myself, this is what we're going to learn about today. So we're going to first learn about what on earth a Baskin shark actually is. Uh, we're going to learn about where we can find them. Uh, and then we're going to talk about their feeding habits, because that's one of the most important things about the Baskin shark. Uh, we're also going to talk about their migration. So where do they go? What do they do? Uh, and we're going to talk about why they are so mysterious. So some of the things that we don't know about them. And then finally, we're going to talk a little bit about what threatens basking sharks and how we can help them. So these are all the things we're going to cover today. But before we do that, I've introduced myself, but I want to introduce you to the basking sharks themselves. So for this, you're going to have to use a little bit of imagination. So I want you to imagine that you're in the waters with me, you're in the sea, we've just jumped off, uh, jumped off our little boat there and you're kind of sitting in the waves. Now, these waters are really, really cold. So we get you to wear a lovely big thick wetsuit. Uh, and this means that you can't feel the cold water at all. Uh, and it also means that you can't sink if you tried. So you're just kind of floating around there, uh, nice, and, nice and safe, nice and lovely, floating around like a cork on top of the sea. And then all of a sudden you see this massive fin coming straight towards you and I tell you to put your head beneath the water and as you put your head underneath the waves at first you can't quite see anything it's a little bit murky and then all of a sudden out of the gloom comes this big dark shape. This is a basking shark. Now you can see the shark actually looks pretty like a great white and that is because they come from the same family as great white sharks. Um, so they have the same body shape. Uh, the difference is that these sharks are about eight to 10 meters long. They are absolutely massive. And as you can see, they just come nice and calmly, come drift straight past us. They're not even bothered. And you can see just a person there just for a bit of, um, just for a bit of scale. And they just drift on nice and past, go about their day, and they're moving pretty slowly. So yeah, so this is our Baskin chalk, and then off she goes, off into the distance. And, and this is exactly what we do with Baskin Shark Scotland. You can see some of our clients there trying to take a picture. You can see our boat there in the background. And this is what we do. We take people in the water to have encounters in Baskin Shark. This guy is just nodding at me there to say you had a great time. Okay. So what is a Baskin shark? You've just met one there. Well, they are the second largest species of shark in the world, second only to the whale shark. Um, so they're eight to 10 meters. That's about 26 to 32 feet long. That's about the same size as a, you know, a small minibus. Uh, and they can weigh up the average around four to five tons in weight, but they can get up to seven tons. So the biggest Baskin shark on record was 12.2 meters long. That's a really, really big animal. But unlike the great white shark, you know, great white sharks are uh, predators. They, they hunt their food. Baskin sharks are actually filter feeders. Um, so that means that they, rather than hunt for their food, uh, they actually filter their food out from the water. And this means that they are pretty gentle giants. So we don't need to be afraid of them. We don't need to be worried about being in the water with them. Uh, as you saw in that video there, they literally just drift straight on past you. They're not that bothered about us at all. Uh, and they get their name from the way that they feed. So you can see in this picture here that the Baskin shark is really close to the surface of the water. And this is where their food is. This is where they stay. And they actually move pretty slowly and at a pretty leisurely pace. And so the basking part of their names means that they're kind of basking in the sunlight there. And, and the Baskin sharks tend to come up to the surface in the summer months when it is nice and sunny. And what are they feeding on? Well, they're actually feeding on something called a copepod, which is a really, really, really tiny little animal. And um, so they're actually uh, a type of plankton and plankton are 
tiny little microscopic animals that are, are really hard to see with the naked eye. So you really need a microscope to look at this, uh, look at this creature. And copepods are actually types of crustaceans, so they're related to things like crabs and shrimp. But these guys, the ones that the Baskin sharks feed on, are only a couple of millimetres in size. They're, they're no bigger than a garden pea. So when you consider the fact that the Baskin shark is actually around eight to ten metres in size, and the thing that they eat is only millimetres, think of how many of these that the Baskin shark has to eat to keep himself going. It is a lot, but we are gonna talk about that in a bit more detail a bit later on. But the first thing I want to talk to you about is where we find basking sharks. So the area where I work, where I live, um, this is nearby a place called the Sea of the Hebrides. And this is actually a hotspot for basking sharks. So this is right on the west coast of Scotland here. And um, so the place that I live, Oban, is kind of over in this direction. Um, and this is a place called the Inner Hebrides, where you get lots of these islands here. So you get places like the Isle of Skye, you get rum. But the place that we're very interested in are two islands called Col and Tyree, which are in the middle here. And this area, the whole sea around Col and Tyree, is one of the best hotspots in the world to find basking sharks. And I know Scotland often sounds very cold, it can look quite grey, the water can look a bit murky, but it does actually look like this. We call it the Caribbean of Scotland because the waters are so beautiful. They're, they've got beautiful turquoise waters, they're very clear. We have these amazing kelp forests. And every summer, so between around May and September, but mainly around you know, July and August, basking sharks come back here every year to feed. And to understand why they do that, we have to go right back and look at the ocean currents. And um, so it's something called the Coriolis effect, which sounds very, very fancy and very scientific, but it's actually really easy to understand. I'll kind of break it down for you. So here we've got planet Earth, the planet on which we live. And Earth doesn't stay still. It's actually moving all the time, but it's moving so slowly that we can't feel it. But I want you to imagine that Earth is almost like a, a tennis ball or a basketball on a stick. Um, so this is Earth on its axis. And basically what happens is Earth spins on its axis constantly. So we're always turning. And this does something really funny to the way that air and water move around the Earth. This is known as the Coriolis effect. So in this diagram here, you've got the equator, that's the middle of the Earth in the middle here. And you can see all these kind of funny arrows all around it. This is the way that, th these are our trade winds. This is the, the or the or wind patterns across the world. And because the Earth is constantly spinning on its axis, that has a really odd effect on the way that the winds move. So bear with me. In the Northern Hemisphere, as, as the, wind travels northwards it is actually deflected to the east and as it comes back down to the equator it's deflected to the west and the opposite happens in the southern hemisphere and you see these kind of little loops to the side that's what that produces those movements make these little loops and they're called gyres and the same thing happens to our water currents the way that water moves around the earth and this is super, super important because this creates the way that this creates our ocean currents all around the world. So you can see them here. You can see these little gyres. And the funny thing about them is, is in the northern hemisphere, these gyres move clockwise. And in the southern hemisphere, they move anti-clockwise. And so what we get is this kind of movement of water all around the world. And some currents are warm. So you can see that by these red arrows here. And some currents are cold. And this creates something called the thermohaline circulation or the ocean conveyor belt. So all the water movements around the world are actually connected. Um, so you can see well, the two things that you need to concentrate on here that I want you to take note of is thermo, which is the temperature of the water, 
and haline, which is how salty the water is. And these are the two most important things that we need to understand when we think about how water is moving around the earth. All right, so I'll just go back one if I can. Oh, I've gone far ahead of where I should be. Okay, there we are, <laughs> we're back. So we're back with this ocean conveyor belt. So to go back on what we've talked about so far, the earth is spinning on its axis. This is having a really funky effect on the way that wind moves around the earth. And it's also having a really funky effect on the way that water moves around the earth. And so what happens is as the earth is spinning, we get this lovely warm water that's being heated up at the equator. And that's being pulled to the north. That's being pulled right up to the north here. And as it moves, it loses heat. It loses heat to the air. And then that also means that it loses fresh water. So it's becoming more salty. And the more cold, the, the cooler water is and the saltier the water is, the heavier that it is. So as it travels north, it begins to sink, okay? And then as it sinks, what it does is it joins a deeper water current of cooler, more nutrient rich water. So the water at the bottom of the ocean has a lot of nutrients in it. And in certain parts around the world, this rich nutrient rich water is brought back up to the surface where it acts almost like a fertilizer and it fertilizes the surface waters of the ocean. And this is so important. This is the, the whole process that all of our ocean life uh, thrives on and is based on. And the, one of the most important ocean currents that we have is called the Gulf Stream. So if you see here, the Gulf of Mexico, this is down in, you know, near the South, near South America, we get this lovely warm water that's heated up at the equator here. And remember those movements, that water is pulled into the colder north. And this, uh, this movement of water is called the Gulf Stream. This is one of our biggest and fasting movement, moving currents in it, on Earth. And what this does, it's so important, it creates the climate that around the UK. If, if we didn't have the Gulf Stream, then we would be much, much colder uh, than we are. And also what it does is around Scotland, around here, we get that nutrient upwelling, we get that lovely nutrient rich water brought up to the surface. And at certain times of year, it creates this kickstarts, this magical, magical process. So if you imagine when it starts to get warmer in spring and summer, we have more sunlight. And then we also have that lovely, you know, nutrient rich water that acts as a fertilizer. And that allows something really, really special to happen. It allows phytoplankton blooms to form. Now, phytoplankton um, is a type of plankton, again, very tiny little microscopic organisms. And these, are, these guys are more like plants, okay? So they can photosynthesize, which means they need sunlight to make their own energy. So they need the right amount of sunlight, just like plants, and the right conditions for them to be able to thrive. So kind of around, around late spring, early summer, we start to see big blooms of phytoplankton forming because those conditions are absolutely perfect. And phytoplankton, you know, these blooms can be so, so big that you can see them from space. They can be absolutely enormous. And then after the phyto, phytoplankton bloom, we get the zooplankton bloom. So these are the animals that are feeding on the phytoplankton. And basically all that zooplankton means is that these guys are animals. So you, you get a huge range of animals right from those tiny little crustaceans that we were talking about earlier to different types of jellyfish and um, to different types of fish. There's lots and lots of animals. And so basically this kickstarts this really magical process. And then after the zooplankton, we get the animals that feed on the zooplankton. So we get you know, tons of different species of fish uh, in Scottish waters. This includes the Atlantic herring, mackerel, sand eels. Um, and again, we can get enormous numbers of these. So this is something called a bait ball. This is where we get lots and lots and lots of those fish kind of all channeled into one area. And they're swimming really tightly round in a circle because they're trying to escape predators. So you can see here, you can see some of the bigger fish coming into this picture. These are mackerel, these tiny little fish that are swimming around in a circle are sand eels. 
And this is really important because this is why our oceans are so productive and it allows a lot of animals to thrive in this area. So we also start to get seabirds. These seabirds are coming in to feed on the fish. Uh, in Scotland, we get some really beautiful seabirds. So these are called gillibots and these are called razorbills. Uh, and we also get everybody's favorite, the puffin. Uh, so these guys, these little characters, this is the Atlantic puffin. Um, they get these orange rings around their eyes and their bills turn orange in summer. Uh, so this is kind of their, this is their, their mating outfit, if you like. So this is what attracts them to each other. And puffins, again, like basking sharks, they come back to UK coastlines every summer uh, to mate and nest. Uh, so they actually nest in little burrows on the ground like rabbits. And these birds absolutely depend on those sand eels uh, to bring up their offspring. So in these little burrows will be a tiny little chick and all summer long the parents fly in and out of the burrows fetching food for their, for their, their babies to eat. And you can see the sand eels hanging out of a puffin's bill there. Uh, and one really fun fact uh, about puffins is that the top of their bill here is actually serrated um, so that they can store multiple fish at once. So they can go and catch a fish, store it in their bill, and then go and catch another one. And usually they have about 20 to 30 sand eels in their bill at any one time. But the most, the highest number of sand eels that a puffin has ever been recorded as having in its bill is 126. It's pretty amazing. Um, so yes, so we get lots of these seabirds coming to feed on the fish that are feeding on the zooplankton, that are feeding on the phytoplankton. It's a massive marine food chain. Uh, we also get, these are my favorite seabird. This is a gannet. And um, they're also one of the biggest species of seabirds that we have. And they've got these kind of beautiful blue piercing eyes and they're diving seabirds. So they'll fly really high in the air. They'll spot a fish in the water and they'll do a really dramatic, really fast dive down into the surface of the water and catch fish. Um, but it's not only seabirds that we get, we also get lots of different species of whales and dolphins that come to feed on our really productive waters as well. So this is another video here. These are some common dolphins. Um, these guys like to catch a ride on the waves on the side of our boat. So this is them doing something called bow riding here. Uh, and you can tell that these are uh, common dolphins because they've got this kind of hourglass patch on the side of the body that makes them really distinctive. Uh, but they're really, really super playful. And these guys actually feed on mackerel. Uh, and we see these a lot. They like to come and play with our boat all the time. But we also get much bigger species of cetaceans as well. So we get uh, a couple of different types of whale. This is called a minky whale. This guy is about eight to 10 meters long. Uh, and they're really distinctive because they've got this white spot on the pectoral fin here. Uh, so we actually call them minky mittens because it looks like they're wearing a pair of gloves. Um, and we also get much bigger species of whale as well. So this was super exciting last year. We actually had some humpback whales. So these guys have come to feed on those sand eels again, those tiny little fish. Um, and basically what they do is they'll do a massive lunge feed. They're called baleen whales. So you can see these plates here. And just like the Baskin sharks, they like to filter their, feed out, their food out from the water and they'll do this big gulp. They'll come right up from underneath, open their mouth and shut their mouth as they come out of the water. And that traps all the tiny little fish into their mouth and they all get sieved out using these kind of hair like structures, which they have as teeth. Um, so yes, this was super, super exciting. You can see some of these little fish here running for their lives, <laughs> trying to escape this big mouth. Um, so yeah, so humpback whales aren't actually commonly found around UK waters, but we are starting to see more of them as our seas uh, warm up. And we're also seeing them at most productive times of the year as well. So as you can see, what I wanted you, what I wanted you to get from that is that the way that our ocean currents operate create kickstart this kind of magical process throughout the summer where we get so much life around these waters. Um, and while we're out on the Baskin shark boats, we see all of these different animals and we get so excited by them. But obviously the thing that we are most excited by is this. 
this is the fin of the Baskin shark. And when we see one of these, we get really excited, run around the boat, shout to the skipper and tell him to stop so we can see this beautiful shark. And um, so this, this is the dorsal fin of the Baskin shark. This is the, the fin that's on the back. Um, and the dorsal fin is actually can be one meter high. It's a very, very big fin. Uh, so it's quite hard to miss. And unlike a whale or dolphin, which are going up and down all the time, the basking shark fin is tracking very slowly through the water, very straight. But we're not just looking for the fin. The basking shark has a very characteristic silhouette uh, that we look out for. So we call it this the three pronged silhouette. So not only can you see the fin, the dorsal fin, but you can also see the tip of the tail fin as well. Uh, so Baskin sharks have something called a caudal uh, or a heterocircal uh, caudal fin, heterocircal tail fin, where the top of the tail is longer than the bottom. So you often see the little tip of the tail sticking out there. And most often you can also see the tip of their nose sticking out the water. And this is really exciting because it means that the Baskin shark is feeding. So we've got the nose, we've got the dorsal fin, and we've got the tip of the tail fin. And the reason it looks like that is because, like I said, the basking sharks, they feed right at the surface of the water. And when they feed, they've always got their mouth wide open. So when their mouth is wide open, their head tends to tilt back and this really pointy bulbous nose sticks out of the water. So that's what we can typically see when we're out, on, uh, out searching for basking sharks. We'll see the tip of the nose, the dorsal fin and the tip of the tail. Uh, and this is because basking sharks are filter feeders, so they feed at the surface of the water and they're one of three species of shark to do this. So the other two species are megamouth sharks, which we don't know so much about. We know that they are a species that live quite deep. They're a very long lived, very historic species. But there's one that I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with another species of shark that is a filter feeder is the whale shark. Um, and whale sharks, what they'll do is they'll suck water into the mouth. Um, whereas a basking shark can't do that. A basking shark is a passive filter feeder. So instead, what they have to do is they have to rely on swimming forward into the water to push the water into the mouth. So what happens? is the water flows into this great big cavernous mouth. And if you have a look, you can see these kind of white structures inside the mouth. These are called gill breakers. And this is basically the filter feeding mechanism of the basking shark. This kind of acts as, as a giant sieve or a giant colander basically. And what these gill rakers do is they catch all of those tiny little copepods that are in the water. You can actually see some of them dotted around in this picture here. They catch all of those tiny little organisms and stop them from going any further. And all the water flows back out the gills here. So water flows in the mouth, copepods get stuck, and the rest of the water that the basking shark doesn't want flows out of the gills. And after this, once all of those lovely, yummy, tasty copepods are stuck in those gill rakers, the basking shark closes his mouth, takes a big gulp and then starts again. So I've actually got a video of this so you can see it really, really clearly. So we've got a basking shark swimming forwards and then he opens his mouth. You see how wide he can open the mouth there. And what's happening is he's channeling all that lovely water into his mouth. The water is coming out of the gills and all this yummy plankton that you can see in the water there uh, is actually getting stuck in the gill rakers so we can swallow them. So this is exactly how a basking shark feeds. But like I said, you can see in the water here how tiny, how tiny these little organisms are that the basking shark is eating. So they have to be, to keep themselves going, they have to be absolute feeding machines. So basically in summer, they are constantly swimming around trying to find the, the areas of the patches of plankton uh, or the most dense patches of plankton to feed on. And that's basically what they're doing 24 seven. Um, and to maximize the amount of food that they can get, they have a mouth that's three foot wide. So that's about a meter. So what I want you to do is I want you to open your arms like this, stretch it as far as you can possibly go. 
And that is about as wide as a basking shark's mouth is. Think about that, it's absolutely huge. Okay, and then we also have the gills completely encircle the head. So remember those gill rakers, those kind of white structures, they go all the way around the head. So the basking shark's got a really big surface area to catch as many copepods as he possibly can. And they can actually filter a crazy amount of water per hour. So it's about 1,500 to 2,000 cubic meters per hour. So if I can think of some kind of equivalent, so you know those big litre bottles of Coke that you get, that's about the equivalent of you drinking about a million of those an hour. It's a crazy amount of, uh, of, of liquid that they're able to filter through. Um, and they also use ocean currents and tides to their advantage. And so like I said, they're passive filter feeders. They can't actually suck the water into the mouth. And um, so sometimes what they'll do is they'll actually swim against a tide or swim against a current so that that water is channeled into the mouth and pushed out through those gills there. So they can, they really maximize the amount of food that they can get. Um, and sometimes when the conditions are just right, they'll get the plankton all caught in one area. So because the, the basking sharks, they're using those tides and they're using those currents, sometimes the plankton is all shoveled into one little area of the ocean and you get a lot of basking sharks all together in one area. Um, so this video here is what I called a basking shark nado. Uh, so there's about six sharks all feeding in the same area. You can see how thick that plankton is in the video. Um, and this guy, this guy is feeding here. And there's another one just beneath him. So keep your eye out. There's another one just behind him there. So sometimes what basking sharks will do, there's the second one just there, is they'll feed in trains. So they'll go just behind each other and they'll sort of travel around like this, feeding. And the reason that scientists think they do this is because it kind of gives the one behind a bit of a hydrodynamic advantage. So they don't have to fight against the resistance of the water so much, but they still get the advantage of being able to eat all that lovely, tasty plankton. Um, so in actual fact, Baskin sharks have quite a nice life. Uh, they're, they're pretty slow moving, they're quite lazy. And basically all they're doing is swimming around with their mouth wide open, eating as much food as they possibly can. Um, but because they are filter feeders, they don't really need a great big complex brain um, to figure out any complex hunting strategies or to, you know, figure out where animals are and to go and catch them. So why waste energy on having a great big brain when you don't need one? So a basking shark, which is eight to 10 meters long, remember, has a brain size of about 10 centimeters. That's really, really tiny. So they have a really, really small brain. Um, so not much is going on, yeah, about, about that big. So not much is going on upstairs at all. Um, but they do have all around the brain, they've kind of got this candy floss-like structure. So there are lots and lots of nerves dedicated to the sense of smell. Um, so we think that the basking shark is able to find those really dense patches of plankton using a very powerful sense of smell. But other than that, they're not really thinking about much. So in all these videos that you've seen, you can see the basking shark isn't really paying much attention to me at all. Uh, all they're concentrating on is where the food is and how they can find it and how much of it they can shovel in their mouth as possible. So that's Believe it or not, that's about as much as we know about the basking shark. Um, so we know that they arrive in hotspot areas between May and September. So, you know, the areas of the Sea of the Hebrides are one of the best hotspots in the world. And we know that they feed on zooplankton, um, so a little animal called a copepod. We also know that they travel huge distances to find this food. So they, they can migrate thousands of kilometers. So basking sharks that feed in Scotland have been found as far as the Azores, you know, as far away as the Azores, they travel miles and miles to find this food. And a, a kind of more recent study that was done last year found that they the same basking sharks return to the same sites and they do so with extended family. So it'll kind of be like, 
grandmothers and great aunties and great cousins all coming back to the same area together. So it's kind of like you go into your favorite restaurant with your extended family. And what we do know is when summer is over, basking sharks go down deep. And um, so some, some studies have found that they're actually, you know, over a thousand meters deep and that's where they are during the winter. And we don't actually know what they do when they're down there. We don't know if they're feeding, we don't know if they're mating. Uh, so a lot of the basking shark's life is actually shrouded in mystery. But this is just a little, uh, a little diagram. Someone put a tag on one of the basking sharks that tends to feed off the Isle of Man, which again is in the UK. And as you can see, this is the colours represent the depth and the arrow represents where the basking shark went. And so over summer, so around July, this basking shark was feeding in, you know, relatively shallow water. Uh, so that's feeding at the surface where the plankton is. And then after summer, uh, he or she starts to travel and they travel a huge distance. They, they're going much, much deeper. And you can see them here. And then in August, they're almost all the way over uh, in the coast of Canada. So that's thousands and thousands of meters that basking shark has traveled. And they're also going much deeper. So thousands of meters deep. Um, and after, after winter is done, they'll go straight back to the area where they were feeding last summer. So there is actually more that we don't know about, about the basking shark than what we do know. So what is it that we don't know? Well, we don't know where and how they mate. We don't know where they give birth. And so therefore we don't know which areas are the most important to the basking shark because we don't know where their breeding sites are and we don't know where their birthing sites are. And this is obviously where they'll be the most vulnerable. And so that means that we don't know how things like climate change will affect them. We don't know what threats there are to the basking shark or where they're the most threatened. So one of the biggest questions that we have about them is how do they make babies and where? So there's a couple, a, a couple of stories. So when we're on the basking shark boats, we've seen behavior that could be mating behavior. We've seen basking sharks thrashing around together on the surface but we're not allowed, we don't have a license to get in the water with them when they're doing that because you don't want to disturb them when they're doing such important behaviors. So it's never actually been scientifically recorded. Um, and there are a few behaviors that basking sharks do that people are like, hmm, could this actually be mating behavior? Uh, so one of these is where basking sharks follow each other really closely. So I mentioned this earlier. And sometimes you can find them nose to tail. And I have seen it before where there's been one or two or three basking sharks all following each other very closely and they're not feeding. Um, so a, a theory is that that might be kind of like a, a precursor to mating, but we're not really sure. The most popular theory at the moment is that it's because it makes it easier for the one behind uh, to feed. They don't have to swim against the resistance of the water because the one at the front is taking it all. But this, is, this could be a mating behavior, we're not sure. Another one is the most exciting thing that a basking shark does and the most energetic a basking shark ever is. Uh, so they are the biggest sharks that can breach. So a breach is basically when an animal fully launches, launches itself out of the water. Um, and we see whales do this and we see uh, you know, other species of shark like the great white shark do this. And the basking shark is actually the biggest species that can do it. And it is amazing when you see it. Uh, so they basically launch themselves fully out the water and kind of flop onto their side and make a great big splash. So there's a couple of theories about why they do this, although we don't really know for certain. So one of the theories is that it's a mating signal. It's for either for a big male to say, hey, look how big and, and strong I am, but also females do it as well. So it could be a, a signal that they're ready to mate. But it could also be something as simple as wanting to get rid of parasites. So basking sharks uh, have a common parasite called a lamprey. It looks like something out of a horror film, doesn't it? Look at its mouth there. Um, and what they do is they attach themselves onto the basking shark's skin and just basically hitch a ride. Um, and we're not entirely sure, but it it, it might not be very comfortable to have lots of these uh, stuck onto your body. They're also parasitic 
copepods, so the same things that they eat, can also become parasites on the Baskin shark's skin. So they might jump out of the water and launch themselves onto the surface to get rid of these parasites. We don't know. Um, or it could be a mating behavior. And also we have, there's no scientific recordings either of a basking shark giving birth. The only account that we have is from two Norwegian fishermen in the 1860s. So just as a bit of history, the basking shark used to be a heavily fished species. So they've got a really, really big oily liver, which we'll talk about a little bit later on, uh, that can be about two thirds of its body size. And they used to be fished for that. Um, and so these two Norwegian fishermen were towing a female basking shark back to shore when all of a sudden five baby basking sharks swam out of the female. And that is the only account that we have of a basking shark giving birth. Uh, and from that one account, what we what scientists have have taken from that is that basking sharks likely uh, are give birth to effectively live young. So the edge ha egg hatches inside the mother. And they also think that they have litters of up to four to five, uh, four to five babies or pups, as they're called. But that is the only account. But we have seen some juvenile Baskin sharks and they are pretty cute. Uh, so when Baskin sharks are first born, they have this kind of weird, twisty, pointed nose, which rounds out as they get older. And no one, again, really knows why they're born with such, a, with such an odd looking nose. And so the popular theory is that it's to, to sort of help them when they're first born to either break out of the egg or it also helps them with feeding. So it kind of helps to channel water into the mouth. But I think they're very, very cute. Uh, but they lose this kind of before they, they reach about a year in age. So because we don't know much about the Baskin shark, we don't actually know what threatens them. Um, but we do know that there are a couple of things that can endanger the Baskin shark. So one of the big ones is hunting for the oil that they have. So shark oil is called squalene oil. And the basking shark has one of the biggest livers of you know, all species of shark. So it's a, it can be a, anywhere between two thirds to a third of its body size. And it contains this, this oil that is really, really good for, for energy. So it used to be used in oil lamps. That's why the basking shark was historically hunted. And they were hunted to, to almost near extinction uh, in UK waters because of this. And believe it or not, the last basking shark fishery in the UK closed as recently as 1997. So it wasn't that long ago that they were being hunted for this. Um, but around the world, we still see squalene oil in cosmetics. Um, so it's something to be to be aware of. It's something to be to be careful about. Uh, but this is one of the, the biggest and longest standing threats to the basking shark. But they're also... Uh, they're also hunted for their fins. So unfortunately they are, they're, they're, they have such big fins that they can bring quite a lot of money uh, into the market. And they can also be uh, tangled in, in fishing gear and suffer from collisions with boats. So this is an individual that we uh, found a couple, couple of years ago. And um, his name is Sore Nose because he has that kind of mark around his nose where he's obviously been caught on a bit of plastic or some rope or something like that. And it's, it's very, very sad, but this is also one of the things that helps us to identify individuals. So individuals like Sornos um, were able to tell when he comes back to the same area because he's got that very distinctive scar across his nose. But this is, you know, one of the threats to Baskin sharks. And then also collisions with boats. Um, so as, you, as you've seen, the Baskin sharks, they're, they're very uh, slow moving and they're, they're very close to the surface and it would be you know quite easy for them to come into contact with boats so that is also one of the threats to them and also we have one of the one of the biggest threats that we have is the potential of you know changes in the way that plankton is distributed around the world due to climate change so climate change remember that ocean conveyor belt that i showed you right at the very very beginning uh, that is actually slowing the conveyor belt down. Um, so it's stopping that nutrient rich water from forming and from being brought up to the surface. And that's having a huge impact 
on where plankton is around the world. So you see this little diagram at the bottom here, it's actually moving. So you can see over the years, um, different species, this is the species that the basking shark favours, is shifting northwards. Um, so that is obviously going to affect the basking shark and, and what it feeds on and, and whether it will be able to adapt to these changes in its environment. And um, so it'll have a knock on effect on all marine life around the world. But in short, um, the basking shark, because we don't know much about it, we don't know what the threats to it are. So it's really, really important that we research more about the basking shark and we learn more about them. And that's what we're hoping to do on the boat. So when we take people in the water with the basking sharks, we're always noting uh, what individuals we see, whether it's a male or a female, and whether we can see anything interesting about them. But yes, so that was a whistle stop tour of the basking shark and who they are and what they are. Um, but yeah, feel free to ask me any questions. I'll be around for, for the next 10 minutes. So yeah, go for it. <laughs> but thank you for listening. Awesome. Thank you so much, Isla. Um, that was amazing and so much detail and so much information. Baskin sharks are one of my favourites. Um, <laughs> I think it's amazing that they are so big and yet we know so little about them, you know? They're, there's so much that we don't know about them. And maybe some of these things are gonna be something that the people watching us one day go on to like discover for themselves. So there you go. Um, yeah, we have perhaps. some amazing questions coming through and I'm really excited about some of them because they're some of my favorite facts about Baskin sharks. Mm -hmm. So um, one of, uh, the classrooms who have joined us for the webinar are asking, do basking sharks have teeth? <laughs> do basking sharks have teeth? That is a brilliant question. And they actually do, uh, even though they don't use them. And um, so they don't have teeth in the way that a great white shark does. So, you know, great white shark has lots and lots of rows of teeth. Uh, the basking shark actually just has a tiny little row of teeth just right on the bottom jaw there. And they don't use them for feeding because obviously they don't need to chew the copepods that they're eating. Uh, so we're not actually sure what the function of them is. We don't know whether it's kind of leftover from, you know, evolution. So they're kind of not used anymore. So they're slowly getting smaller over time or whether again, it's, um, it's something for mating. So sometimes we do find uh, females with scratches on the side of them, which can only be made from teeth. And so the thought is, is that they actually use these tiny little teeth to grab onto one another when they're mating. But yes, in answer to your question, it is a brilliant question. They do have, they do have teeth, but very, very, very tiny little ones right on the bottom jaw. Go and check out a photo of Baskin shark teeth. They really are tiny. Um, I love yeah. that people never realise that Baskin sharks actually have teeth. But yeah. Um, and uh, one of the follow up questions on that is, do we know if and how these sharks lose their teeth? Do they lose these teeth that they have? Oh, I don't actually know the answer to that question because we don't actually know what the function of them a function of them is I mean do you know that Jenny do you know if they lose them um I don't I know that other species of sharks lose and replace their teeth a lot and if basking <laughs> sharks are using them to mate it's not um it wouldn't be surprising that they break off and they have to grow them back so yeah um, exactly exactly we, because I mean a lot of shark species as a lot of people on on this call will know already they have this almost like conveyor belt of teeth so you have all the, the, the new ones behind and when the old one falls out, there's a new one right behind it waiting to come in. Uh, but maybe that would be a really good idea for a scientific project actually is do basking sharks lose their teeth? And if so, yeah. how do they get new ones? Yeah. Because you can imagine if they are using them for mating, you're exactly right. If they are using them to clamp on to another basking shark, it is likely that one of them might get ripped out. So exactly. awesome. Fascinating. So Next question. Do we know how old Baskin sharks grow up to be? Oh, it's an excellent question. And no, we don't know the answer to that. Um, we imagine they're very long lived. Um, so a lot of species that are similar to the Baskin shark, we know 
uh, can can reach you know 50 almost 100 years old um, and you know the Baskin shark from what little we know about their their breeding habits and um, they you know they give birth to live young that's usually the sign of a of a species that's that's very long lived and um, but the reason we don't quite know how long basking sharks live for is is for two reasons so the first reason is because they were so heavily exploited um you know for, for centuries that the population is only just recovering so the individuals that we're seeing now are, are likely to only kind of have you know have just recovered so we're not seeing them fully grown and the other reason is it's it's also very very difficult to tag sharks so this is why we're only just getting all this lovely information about kind of where they go and what the habits are which makes it very hard to identify individuals and also age individuals as well so yeah it's a really good question but we think they can live for a very long time yeah uh, i mean the as you were saying baskin sharks were hunted very close to extinction uh, and that that fisheries only stopped in the 90s uh in europe and so that means that the sharks we're seeing now are maybe only as young as 25 20 years mm -hmm. old if they were born after the fisheries closed so yeah. we there's still so much that we don't know and it's really exciting to see um to, to find out more about these animals and maybe to start seeing their populations do a little bit better. Yes. Um, so question number three, um, do relating to that, do we know, you said they get to up to 10 meters long. Do mm -hmm. we know if they could grow any bigger than that? Yes. So the biggest basking shark on record was 12.2 meters. Uh, and we don't actually know how old that individual was. Um, so that's about the maximum size that they get. The ones that we normally see are around seven, seven to nine meters long. But as you said, they could only be 20 years old. So who knows? Who knows? Um, but yeah, they can they can get pretty enormous. <laughs> um, uh, sometimes in sorry, in relation to size as well. Um, the way that you know that uh, that you have a really big basking shark is their dorsal fin starts to curve over it almost gets too heavy um so yeah we have seen a couple of really big males before with the curved dorsal fin wow. um which is really really wow. cool um uh okay so maybe a little bit related to their size but um we thought that White, for a very long time, we thought that great white sharks were the apex predator to, of the sea. Mm -hmm. And then we realized that actually there is something that's above them that eats them, which is orcas. Yeah. So do basking sharks have natural predators? So again, this is something that we're not quite sure of. Um, so it would make sense that if an orca, you know, goes after a great white that something like a baskin shark might be pretty a, a pretty attractive prospect i can imagine that a baskin shark is quite a vulnerable <laughs> a vulnerable source of prey because like i said they're quite dopey they move quite slowly um but i i don't think there's i mean please if somebody has heard about this and um, please let me know but i i've never heard of a, an orca going after a baskin shark or i've never seen an orca go after a baskin shark and i mean over winter as well they spend a lot of their time at very very deep depths as well which might protect them a little bit more uh, from predators but yeah this is something that i've never seen or ever heard of have you ever heard of that before jenny i've never heard of that but i also wonder if being that deep means that we would never find their bodies if they were being mm. hunted by orcas mm. in the same way so awesome. great white sharks, their their bodies will wash up on the shore and we'll find them without their liver inside, which is amazing. These orcas yes. are really intelligent. Yeah, well, orca, um, I mean, the thing about orca is that there's there's lots of different, they call them ecotypes, uh, and they specialize on particular different types of prey. Um, and so the shark thing, the fact that they've gone after sharks in South Africa, that's relatively new. So it could be that we maybe start to see a kind of new a new development in them going after bass and sharks. I hope not. <laughs> I do hope not. We do have a pod of orca, uh, a resident pod on the west coast, um, but they specialise. They're seal seal eaters mostly, 
Um, so the Baskin chocks here I don't think are in any danger, but yeah, I'm not sure. I wonder what a Baskin chalk would taste like. <laughs> yeah, well, beyond that, I guess the only other natural predators they have are humans. You know, we've For been us, yeah. yeah. Um, um, yeah. So speaking of them going really deep in the winter, someone's mm -hmm. asked a question that made me chuckle when I read it because they've asked, maybe they go to sleep or hibernate down in the deep. Yes. That, yes, that's a really good point. And that was one of the that was one of the popular theories up until a couple of years ago. Um, so it did the people did used to think that they would go down deep to hibernate, but there have been a couple of studies. It's it's very, very difficult to figure out what a basking shot does down there because the tags that we have, you know, quite often they'll come off or they don't they don't work at those kinds of depths. Um, because you know there's there's a lot of pressure, it's very cold. Um but there has been a couple of studies that have found or, or suggesting that basking sharks are still feeding when they're down there. Um, so there is a species of plankton that they potentially switch to um, or they kind of go into, it's almost like a semi-hibernation. So they're, they kind of slow down a bit. So they're not, they're not needing to feed or they're not eating as much. Um, but yes, um, that was I think it still is a theory, um, but it was a very, very popular theory that they that they're hibing down, hibernating down there. So you are not you're not wrong. Yeah. Some amazing questions coming through, and I love that some of these we just don't know the answers to because maybe you guys can go and look for the answers. So um, I I don't even know which ones to pick anymore. I there's a great one here um, which um, I don't know if you know the answer to, but. Someone asks, can basking sharks get sick? Can they get sick? Um, so one of that reminds me of one of the facts that we had on uh, on the whole tooth, which was the fact that, bas that that sharks can't get cancer, which I think is really cool. So I wonder if that's where that question came from. Um, so I imagine that just like any animal, basking sharks could get sick. Uh, but I think one of the things that um i'm most concerned about is actually uh, it's actually microplastics that could make them sick um so we don't know this for certain but sometimes we do take little plankton samples so we'll get a little uh, a little plastic canister and we'll fill it with 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 water and we'll have a look at how many plankton are, are in the water and we we put them kind of in a little petri dish and put them on a grid to see the size of the plankton um, and we've actually found that there are fragments of microplastic that are the same size as the copepods that the Baskin sharks are eating, which potentially means that they're filtering them out and ingesting them. Um, and we know from other apex predators like the orca um, that that can cause some serious damage. So, you know, they do, um, it's almost like they're being polluted by these microplastics. So that could make them sick. Um, we've not seen that many uh, specimens sort of uh, beached or, you know, washed up on the shore to actually test that. Um, but yes, absolutely. I mean, basking sharks, I imagine, can can get sick. And that is probably one of the things that worries me, that would worry me the most. Well, something really interesting um, on that question is that this year, sadly, there were a couple of strandings of basking sharks uh, in the UK. Mm -hmm. And one of them was investigated by uh, CSIP, who are an organization who look into strandings of mainly cetaceans, but sometimes when Baskin sharks wash up on the shore, they'll go and look, look at them too. And they found that that shark had, caught, had meningitis. Meningitis? Oh, yeah. Wow. So Baskin sharks, and I think there's another record of a Baskin shark getting septicemia. So sharks can certainly get sick, yes. Um, is the answer to that one but we don't know again yet again we don't know much about how sick they get and how often they get sick um, these are all questions that are left unanswered yeah I have to look those up Jenny I hadn't I hadn't actually heard about them but yeah that's that's really fascinating yeah um, fascinating and sad unfortunately but they are <laughs> They are a great opportunity when these things happen. They're really sad, but they're also a great opportunity for us to find out more about these animals and make the most of a, out of a sad situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, let's get, if you still have a few more minutes, we still have lots yeah. of questions come through. Absolutely. Um, 
Daniela's students have three questions. Uh, we've answered one of them, uh, which was the one about predators. Um, the second one relates to what they feed on. How much plankton do they actually need to eat in order to be full? Oh, in order to be full. Um, I mean, can can basking sharks get full? I think that's a that's another really interesting question because they're just constantly feeding. Well, if you if you consider the fact that they're, they're only, you know, two to three millimeters in size, so they're really, really tiny, these organisms. Um, and I don't know the exact answer to your question, but I think I mentioned this earlier. They have to filter about 1,500 to 2,000 cubic meters of seawater an hour um, to get the amount of food that they need. Um, so the only way that I could think of the equivalent to that was of you drinking one million litre bottles of coke an hour. Um, so the answer is a lot. But the thing to remember about these little tiny copepods is that they're extremely energy rich. So although they're little, um, there's a lot of calories inside a copepod. Um, so although the Baskin shark has to eat a lot of them, they are a very energy rich source of food. Um, and they prefer a specific type of copepod called, it's a, it's a species called Calanus. Um, and they prefer a certain size as well. So they like, unsurprisingly, they, they like the big, fat, juicy ones. <laughs> so that's that's what they're searching for. So yeah, um, but everything about them, they're specialized to try and find the biggest, most dense uh, aggregations of plankton. But yeah, it's a really brilliant question. The answer is a lot, <laughs> a lot, a lot. Yeah. And does that mean they're at the top of the food chain or where does that place them in the food chain? Mm, that's a really interesting question. So, oh, I'm not entirely sure. Well, if you think about the way that food chains work, so you would say that the plankton is quite near the bottom of the food chain. So I would say that basking sharks are, you know, just just above them. But then as we discussed earlier, what feeds on the basking shark? you know so that's that's a very tricky it's just tricky to place them on the food chain actually yeah. we have the same problem with species like humpback whales as well that feed on very 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 small organisms that are quite far down the food chain uh but you know not very much eats them but i suppose as well to remember is that with all these big animals when they do eventually die their carcasses do drift down to the seafloor and become part of that very nutrient rich water so that again brings them right to the the bottom of the food chain when they do break down that's a brilliant question yeah yeah and it's true that like we think a lot about um the food chain as a chain but actually it looks more like a web like mm -hmm. a lots of animals eating each other and things below them with nothing eating them or something eating them um so it's really hard to untangle uh, all of that but it's really interesting you guys have some amazing questions out there yeah definitely uh tina asks will the copepods they eat ever run out oh will they ever run out um it depends on how the environment changes. So we're actually finding that, uh, I kind of mentioned this a little bit towards the end, but as our, our waters are warming, there are different types of plankton. And so the, the way that the plankton is just distributed around the world is changing, is, is changing. And it might be that as our, as our climate warms, different species of, clank, of plankton will die out. Uh, that can't cope with these warming waters and they can't cope with the new climate. Um, but whether Baskin sharks can adapt to that, uh, that is something that we will, that we'll have to wait and see, unfortunately. Uh, but I mean, it, you know, it is a possibility that could, that could effectively happen. But I think it will, it's, it's a long time in the future before that actually does happen. But yes, um, I mean, the, these, the, the plankton are, are very much like, you know, a lot of other species in that they are very dependent on certain conditions. So if those conditions go away or they don't exist anymore, we might find that that particular species of plankton does die out. So, yeah, it could, could happen. Hopefully not, but it could. <laughs> Um, and really quick, there's another question from the same uh, same classroom or same person, and they ask, do they actually chew their food or do they just swallow it? 
Um, so no, they don't. So they they actually just just swallow their food. But you do see sometimes. I, I do wonder whether they get things stuck, because you'll see sometimes. So they'll have their their mouth open and they'll go for a little while and then they'll close the mouth, and you see them do a big gulp, and then they kind of cough afterwards. So it's oh, yeah. kind of go ha ha. Um, and I wonder if that's a sort of dislodge anything that they maybe should have chewed. Um, so yes, they don't have the best table manners, Baskin sharks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and isn't it that true that their the back of their throat, where they their throat where they swallow, is actually really small? You, you could yes fit in there. Yes. So one of the one of the most common questions that I get asked on the boat is, can what happens if you go inside the Baskin shark's mouth? Um, because it can be quite intimidating when you've got that huge mouth just coming straight towards you. Um, and sometimes they will just kind of go off to the side, but sometimes it does look like you're going to get swallowed. But actually their throat is very, very small. It's very, very narrow. So we couldn't fit in it even if the Baskin shark wanted to eat us. <laughs> so yeah, so so that's very true. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I, I bet things do get stuck. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. Right, we'll try and get through a couple more questions and then I'll yeah. let you go. Um, go so, Madame Beauchamp's grade six class want to know how long have sharks been around? Well, sharks have been around for millions and millions of years. They're, they're very, very, very old uh, species of fish. Um, so they were around way before we were, um, and they were around in kind of they were they were pre they were prehistoric sharks. And one of the most famous one is Megalodon, who is this huge, great big shark of of which the size we've never seen again. Um, so I think people think that, or scientists think that Megalodon was sort of like a, an or great whites are sort of like a descendant of Megalodon. Um, so he was a very fearsome predator. Uh, but yeah, they've they've been around for millions of years a very very long time so they've had a very long time to uh, evolve and adapt but also some of them still look very prehistoric so if, to me the basking shark looks extremely prehistoric he looks like you've, you've just lifted him out of the dinosaur age <laughs> well speaking of adaptations we have a question that asks what are some of the baskin sharks adaptations now i know you could probably talk for hours about all of the adaptations that um sharks have but are there any specific to baskin sharks yes yeah, definitely. Um, so the biggest thing for the Baskin shark is obviously feeding as much as possible. Um, because like one of the previous questions that we had, um, they have to eat so much of these tiny plankton to keep themselves going. So the Baskin shark is specifically adapted to be a feeding machine. Um, so you see the size of the mouth there, so they can extend that mouth to almost a meter or three foot wide. Um, they have a huge surface area inside the mouth, so they've got lots of those gill rakers um, and the, the gills fully encircle the head. So in some species, the, the gills are kind of only quarter or a, th or a third, whereas with the Baskin shark, it's all around the head. So they have a huge surface area and um, their body shape as well. So this is something that I didn't talk about. Their body shape is they're incredibly powerful animals because what they're having to do is swim against the tide or swim against the current to use the momentum of the water to push more water into the mouth. Um, so they have a very big, powerful tail and also their body, they've got a, a, a it's called a fusiform body and it's very streamlined um, to allow them to kind of move through the water as effectively as possible. Um, so yes, yeah, so they've got a few very special adaptations. And like I mentioned earlier as well, they've got a really tiny brain, but all around it is this huge, great big mass of nerves, which are all dedicated to the sense of smell. So the basking shark can seek out that tasty plankton. But yes, uh, so those are just some, those are just some of the adaptations that they have. I have a, a question, a follow-up question on that. Mm. You mentioned mm -hmm. how you sometimes see uh, when you see a Baskin shark from the surface, you have that three pronged um, silhouette that you can see. And one of those is the nose sticking out of the water. Do yeah. they ever swim with that nose sticking out of the water when they're not feeding? Ah, oh, so I know, actually, I've, I've not seen one do that. So normally you can tell. So we don't get in the water with them when they're not feeding because they, they tend to be a little bit more skittish and you can tell they're not really 
interested in having people around them um, and so usually you just see the dorsal fin and the tip of the tail and the tip of the tail sort of moving like this and they tend to be moving a little bit faster um, so really you tend to see the nose when the mouth is open um, so I think the first video that I showed you know when you go down into the water and this this baskin shark looms at you you can see when it's got the mouth closed its actual snout is quite narrow and quite small um, and it's only when they extend the mouth, when they open the mouth, that that nose sticks out of the water. Mm. Um, and also when they're, when they're kind of just swimming around, they tend to be beneath the surface as well. So they don't tend to be right at the surface when they, when they have the mouth closed. But yeah, that was a really good question. <laughs> All right. So um, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions about your career. Um, okay, and go for it. There. Um, but first... I'm going to ask you a sneaky question, which is, what's your favourite shark species? Is it the Baskin shark? <gasps> oh, I, oh, you know what? I would have to say the Baskin shark is one of my favourite species. So that's kind of a little way around it. Um, I do have a, I do have a soft spot for Baskin sharks just because I've worked with them for a couple of years now, and you get to know them, and they're just they're just brilliant they're kind of very gentle very dopey just sort of going about their day um, and I love the fact that we don't know that much about them um, but there is another quite mysterious species that we find in Scotland called the flapper skate um, so it's actually it's a species of skate uh, still still within the sharks and rays group but um, they are beautiful animals they are enormous animals as well and again they're very very elusive we don't actually know much about them and um, they lay these enormous eggs that are kind of about that big uh, and you can sometimes find the egg cases on the beach but there was they're, they're quite a deep living species and we think we only just think that they're coming up shallow to lay eggs um, and one time I was on a dive and I was about 60 meters um, and my buddy started screaming down her down her <laughs> regulator, uh, and I turned to the turned to the left, and the flapper skate just went straight over our heads and sort of drifted off into the distance. They kind of swim a bit like a spaceship, if anyone's seen, you know, almost kind of like a manta ray or something like that. But they're they're very very awesome, and because you don't see them very often, they're they're very special. Amazing, so, yeah. Flapper skates are very impressive. Yeah. All right. So let's finish with the big bucks question. Um, what made you want to do your job? And do you have any advice for kids out there who might want to go into shark science or wildlife watching, all of that? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I grew up next to the sea. I was really, really lucky. And so I grew up on the East Coast, um, of the UK uh, and so I was forever in the North Sea and I was always exploring rock pools and I was so fascinated by marine life um, and I was spent most of my time in the water as I still do now and um, so when I kind of came to the end of school and I was thinking about university I didn't actually know quite what I want to do and then one of my uh, biology teachers suggested that I do something called zoology which is just the study of animals in general and it just so happened that the university I went to was also right next to the sea and had a really good marine science program. And it just made sense for me to do that. Um, so that's why I decided to go down that road. Um, I actually do something a little bit different now. So I look at the kind of social and political side of conservation. And I kind of more study people than I do animals. Um, but I like to keep my toes in the water. So I did do, I, I, finished my master's in marine science and then since then you know I learned how to dive uh, and I work with Baskin Shark Scotland because I love being by the sea so much and it kind of helps to keep me connected to that side um, so that's why I kind of got into it and I mean who wouldn't love spending your summers zooming around on a boat in the middle of the Hebrides and looking at all this incredible wildlife and swimming with sharks and it's just a really really brilliant job uh, but as for advice, um, on the scientific side of things, um, I think if you want to be a scientist, 
just spend spend some time and find out what it is that you're really really interested in because you could really want to study sharks but what is it about sharks that you want to study I mean there's so many different questions I mean hopefully this presentation gave you some ideas uh, because basking sharks is a lot that we need to find out about them but the same is you can the same can be said for many different species of shark as well uh, so there's a, a lot of them have a lot of mysteries surrounding them so take your time and kind of figure out uh, you know, what is it, what is it specifically that you're actually interested in? What is your core research question? Um, but the biggest piece of advice I can give as well is stay really open minded. So there's so many different things that you can do. So you could go down the science route or you could go down the guiding route or you could do both like I have. Um, so as many different experiences as you can get uh, to help you figure out what it is that you want to do. That's the best thing that that you can do is to go out and have a, a huge diversity of experiences as if as you can and also speak to a lot of different people who are you know in different fields and um, so you know my my details are there feel free to ask me questions if you want to and most people are really really happy to speak to you about careers and about how you can how you can possibly go on the same career path as them so yeah speak to as many different people as possible um and you know if you can if you're able to uh get some experience you know maybe uh heading out on a boat or volunteering uh with a with a charity or something like that and just get yourself out there and get some experience under your belt Yes. That is some awesome advice. And yeah, you, you're never too young to start. So go out there and ask some questions. And there are lots and lots of citizen science projects that you can get involved now with. So we have yeah. lots in the UK and I'm sure you have some where you live. So go and find Absolutely. out. I mean, one of the easiest things that you can do if you've got access to a beach um, is to just head down to your local beach and uh wander along and see what you can find so essentially do like do a litter pick but there's a couple of organizations in the uk so say you find shark egg cases and um, if you can report them to the shark trust for example so there's a couple of different things you can do there um and you know even if you don't have access to a beach there's a lot of things that you can be part of online um that can help you build your experience and sort of build your knowledge um, but another thing, just when you said you're not, you're never too young to start. Also, don't panic if you kind of get to, if you get a bit older and you don't quite know what you want to do. Because I didn't know what I want to do, and for a big part, I still don't. Um, so that's the exciting thing is that you, you kind of don't know what's coming. So keep an open mind and don't panic too much if that's right. you don't know you're what you want to do. Young and you're never too old. Yeah, no, exactly. No good time to start. There's no bad time to start. Um, exactly. All right. Well, thank you so much, Iowa. I would ask you where to, where we can find you and where we can follow you, but there it is on the screen. So if anyone wants to check out Isla further and have a look at what she gets up to, go and follow her on uh, Instagram and Twitter. Um, and follow Bask and Shark Scotland as well to keep up to date with their adventures over the summer. Um, you can also re-watch this talk when it shows up on YouTube in a couple of days. Um, it will be up on our channel and you can rewatch all of the previous webinars as well if you missed any. Make sure to join us next Tuesday at 1 p.m. EST and 5 p.m. GMT this time for a talk by Lizzie Daly, who is a wildlife presenter. Um, she's going to be giving a talk on wildlife filmmaking and it's going to be amazing. So uh, come along and watch that as well. Um, and check out our website, sharksforkids.com. There's lots of activities, coloring sheets, uh, crafts that you can do, fact sheets, everything. Um, and you can keep up with the webinars that we've got coming up as well. So that's it from us this week. Thank you so much, Isla, for that amazing talk. I want to go out and see Baskin Sharks. <laughs> I can't believe I live in Ireland and still haven't seen them, but you know. Well, you'll have to come across. You'll have to come out on the boats with us and we'll make sure that you can yeah. do one. I'm in Oban quite often, so maybe I'll come. Are you? Yeah. Um, yeah. So if anyone ever comes to Scotland or Ireland, it's a great place to go and see the Baskin Sharks. Um, thank you, everyone, and we'll see you next week.
Thanks for having me. No worries. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much.